Hello, everyone, and welcome to our December uh, ALS Learning Series with Dr. Melinda Kavanaugh. Um, today, we're going to cover mental health needs and supports for people living with ALS and their caregivers. Um, before we get started today, I just want to remind you all that you are muted and you are off camera, so just sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation. It should take about an hour. Um, if for any reason you have to run or um, you know somebody who registered but couldn't make it or after the fact you think, oh gosh, it would have been great if so-and-so saw this presentation, know that, again, it's being recorded, so it should be up on our website and our YouTube channel within the next, like, 48 hours. Um, I'm Anne Marie Doyle. I'm the Community Education Manager at the Les Turner ALS Foundation. And I'm just going to tell you quickly a little bit more about um, our foundation. Um, first things first, though, uh, these learning series wouldn't be possible without um, a donation from the Gilbert and Jacqueline Fern Foundation and our industry partners, Mitsubishi, Tanaba, Pharma America, and Biogen. So who are we? We are leaders in comprehensive, personalized ALS care and research. We realize that people living with ALS may feel overwhelmed and unsure of what questions to ask or what to do next. And that's really where our support services team shines. Our support services team is comprised of knowledgeable and compassionate nurses and social workers with many years of experience guiding people and their families um, through that ALS journey. We offer a variety of services, um, including care visits by ALS support coordinators, need-based grants, and connecting people to community resources. At the Lois and Solia ALS Clinic at the Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine, we offer access to enrollment and clinical trials and a multidisciplinary care team to provide comprehensive support and care. If you're looking for more information on symptoms, care options, or are interested in browsing any past learning series, you can visit us at the Les Turner ALS um, Foundation website, so Les Turner ALS. We know that making decisions about your ALS care can be overwhelming, um, but again, we're here to help. Um, the Les Turner ALS Foundation developed My ALS Decision Tool to help you learn about your options. We currently have modules on breathing support, nutrition support, and genetic testing. Again, all of that can be found on our website at lesturnerals.org. Okay, so now my favorite part, I get to introduce you to Dr. Melinda Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh is a professor of social work at the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and is a licensed clinical social worker in neurology. Dr. Kavanaugh's clinical experience informed her focus on clinical care and caregiving research. Her US and international research has been funded by the National Institute of Health, the Administration on Community Living, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and the ALS Association. Dr. Kavanaugh's research focuses on caregiver well-being, mental health, and support interventions, including Y Care, a multidisciplinary youth caregiving skills and support protocol for young caregivers um, who work with people or live with people, have family members living with ALS, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and autism. Dr. Kavanaugh is also the president of Global Neuro Y Care, an international nonprofit focused on developing programs and supports for children, youth, and families and neurological disorders in underserved areas. We are so excited to have you. Thank you so much, Melinda. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's always so weird to hear to sit here and listen to someone introduce you, but um, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here. I'm gonna try to make sure that I um, show my screen. Now, can you see that, that Anne-Marie? Yep, that looks great. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. I always, always enjoy working with um, the Les Turner Foundation. I think everything that they do is just brilliant. And um, quite frankly, they're um, kind of in, we're in each other's backyards. They're in Chicago and I'm in Milwaukee. Um, I have a slide on my background, but I won't belabor that. Um, really the, the reason I like to make sure that I put up some of the work that I'm doing that it really underpins the conversation that we're going to have, that I do approach everything, all of my research, all of these webinars, really from my uh, clinical expertise and my training as a clinical social worker, particularly with my expertise in neurology. Um, I'm really excited about uh, our foundation that Anne-Marie mentioned. I'll be talking more about that here in just a little bit. So the overview of the webinar. So when, when they asked if I would do a webinar on mental health, I, I absolutely jumped at it and said completely 100% yes. Uh, what I would like to put a caveat is, this is such a huge topic. Um, everybody on this call, I'm quite sure that you are all well aware of the absolute complexity of living with providing care for, um, grieving someone who has lived with ALS, and the potential for numerous and complex uh, mental health needs, is it can really be overwhelming. And quite frankly, this topic can be multiple webinars. So I just wanna put that out there. I wanna be really clear that by no means is this one 45, 50 minute webinar supposed to cover all of the topics. But I want to make sure that in putting this together, I addressed not only specific populations, kind of brief overview, talking about persons living with ALS, their adult caregiver, and then their children and youth caregivers. And these are definitely the most um, unaddressed and really most vulnerable caregivers. And when we think about mental health, the complexity of mental health issues really extends across all of our family members and all of the caregivers associated. So in this webinar, we're going to touch on all three of those populations. In that, I also am going to talk a little bit about um, testing and risk. Um, not going to say, you know, where you should or should you or, or whatnot, but just provide an initial conversation. It's becoming more and more um, critical in our care for and understanding ALS. Um, and then also going to spend some time on end of life grief and loss. And these are absolutely part and parcel of that mental health experience. You really cannot talk about mental health in ALS without also engaging these um, kind of conversations. So what do we mean by mental health? I think these, this is kind of a phrase that gets bantered around a lot. And if you look up you know, Webster's uh, dictionary, you'll see it's, it's really about our psychological and our emotional well-being. So what that means is how well are we kind of emotionally managing things? How well are we emotionally responding um, or not well emotionally responding? What is our kind of cognitive thought process? How is that informed by our emotions? How are these things interplaying with each other when it comes to living with or providing care for someone with ALS. And we're going to talk about that, but I can't go forward without saying there is not enough attention paid uh, to the needs, the health needs of persons living with ALS and their caregivers, both children and adults. And the people who are doing some really amazing work, you'll see I have references throughout this presentation. I have a massive bibliography in the back. Um, you will have access to it. I hope you look up some of these um, research studies because they really are providing the meat for this talk. But what we do know is that there are not enough mental health providers out there, uh, particularly in the United States, that understand ALS and can really um, support both person living with ALS and their caregiver. And later on, I'm going to talk about um, a new program that is really looking at how we can train and engage and support 
mental health providers around ALS. So we'll start with mental health in persons living with ALS. So we know that ALS is just, it's overwhelming and it absolutely affects our mental health and it affects mental health in several ways. Um, we see that persons living with ALS do have higher rates of depression and anxiety. We also understand that people living with ALS experience apathy and other kind of behavioral responses. And in the next slide, we're gonna talk about what that might be. But it's really important for particularly some of our family members on this call to know that all of these and other issues related to mental health are very much uh, a part of or common with the ALS experience. And that's incredibly important when we think about how best to support our loved ones living with ALS. But what we also know is it isn't just the depression or anxiety that people are feeling, it's also issues around stigma and social isolation and even some shame. And this really comes about because of the way in which the world sees people living with ALS, using assistive devices, uh, not being able to do certain things for themselves that other people take for granted. And so our society has a way of kind of responding to individuals living with ALS and their caregivers, creating um, an often very stigmatizing experience. And that has um, a real impact on the mental health and well-being of our family members living with ALS. And both myself and my colleagues in the Netherlands have looked into this. And we've really found there are very, very clear ways in which people living with ALS socially isolate because of some of those emotional responses to that stigma. So if you're on this call and you're a caregiver, you're a family member, you know, those are very, very real experiences that you're likely experiencing as well. And they have everything to do with that mental health, and remember mental health being both that psychological and that emotional uh, well-being and response to living with ALS. So what do we think about addressing mental health concerns? And this is again for people who are living with ALS. And these are just some of the very few ways that you can think about. Um, psychotherapy, as we said before, there are not enough mental health providers, but if you can find a mental health provider, it is extraordinary to be able to go to talk to someone and share some of these issues around depression and anxiety, particularly those who are experiencing some very severe depression as it relates to ALS. Um, there's some really interesting work around meditation, kind of calming those anxieties, particularly as it relates to how the disease is progressing. Uh, peer support groups, so Les Turner does an amazing job at that. There are other ALS organizations, depending on where you are around the United States, that provide um, many, many opportunities for peers to really come together. And, and, and this is so important. We kind of thought, oh, support groups. But the, the key piece there is peers. And when someone is feeling stigmatized and isolated and socially alone, that importance of a peer cannot be underscored enough. And having that opportunity to kind of reflect back to each other experiences, reflect back to each other, mental health concerns, some depression issues, maybe some anxiety about how the disease is progressing. So looking for those peer supports, those opportunity to engage like with like is critical. And the last one is medication. The truth is there are quite a few medications out there that help with depression and anxiety. And we know that a large percentage of our, of our persons living with ALS are taking um, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. So, you know, certainly don't hesitate to talk to your doctor about that if this hasn't been brought up. But if you are having, really struggling with some of these mental health issues, don't hesitate to ask and see what medication may or may not be useful for you. Um, and when we're thinking about, and this might be maybe a little bit more for our caregivers and our family members on the call, 
But if you're thinking about what are some of those causes of the mental health issues and you're living with some with ALS, you know, we know that depression is very clearly associated with an initial diagnosis. So recognizing that, going immediately and looking for some uh, mental health care, some psychotherapy, talking with the Les Turner organization, talking with other ALS organizations so that you can address that as soon as possible. We also know that there is cognitive impairment associated with ALS and that there is often a possible overlap with frontotemporal degeneration. And so these are things that really need to be discussed and understood about issues around behavior changes, cognitive changes. That's where some of the apathy comes in. So knowing that the mental health concerns are not just existing all by themselves, they exist often as it relates to certain issues with the disease itself and progression of the disease. And we see that particularly with anxiety. As the disease progresses and symptoms get worse or symptoms change or become more present, particularly around breathing issues and fears around death and dying and end of life, that's where we see a fair amount of anxiety. And recognizing that if you're in the earlier stages, knowing how do you prepare for that? Who can you talk to? What kind of peer support can you go to to say, if this is coming down the line, what are things that I need to be thinking about to make sure that my mental health is, um, is addressed and really attended to? And the last one, that issue, and I brought it up um, earlier, but the stigma and depression that is often due to the use of assistive devices, the use of having a caregiver help you eat. Um, these are things that society, frankly, doesn't always do a very good job of looking at or thinking about or engaging with. So certainly all of these issues that we're talking about um, really can be attended to and thinking about the cause of potential mental health issues and, and where on the trajectory of ALS they might hit will help you either prepare or address um, as things go along and as things change. The other area that we want to talk about is caregiver mental health. And Caregiving is overwhelming. It's certainly not easy. Um, it can be incredibly stressful, particularly for an illness like ALS that often has a very quick progression and has many complicated symptoms that goes along with it. So what we see in our caregivers, we know very clearly about caregiver mental health are very similar to um, what we see in our people living with ALS. But there are some very different um, kind of aspects about the care process that do affect mental health in our caregiver, remembering that kind of psychological and emotional well-being. And we see anxiety, particularly around progression, um, the stress. And the stress of caregiving isn't always just about caregiving. Stress of caregiving is I'm providing care, but maybe I also have children. Maybe I also am caring for an older adult. Maybe I'm also working full time. So the complexity of being a caregiver cannot be kind of underscored enough. And the exhaustion, we know. So I do a lot of research around sleep and how sleep as a caregiver is so, so critical. And when we don't have enough sleep, when we are exhausted, our mental health is absolutely impaired because psychologically, are we able to kind of think things through? Is our cognition impaired? Yes. Um, are we exhausted to the point where emotions are very much frayed and we respond from a place of um, uh, like, like an immediate response as opposed to kind of being able to think through it? Um, also, and something caregivers frequently struggle with talking about, but anger. Um, that real anger of why is this happening, um, also anger of why are there not more supports, right? And oftentimes caregivers really do like to be able to kind of talk about that because it feels very self-serving. And, and it's so, so critical that caregivers be able to have 
all of those conversations about all of those feelings without judgment. Because what we see at the end often with caregiving is an incredible amount of burnout. And it's a terrible word, but it's a visceral word because what it shows is that stress, that anxiety, that exhaustion, that that anger, it can burn, it can build up and create just inability to often function and move forward. And what that does to a caregiver's mental health is very, very clear. We see tremendous amounts of depression. Um, and speaking back to the previous slide, the need to be able to get that support might even be in the way of um, getting some medication support. But the caregiver mental health around burnout and around the complexity of care is so important. And, and I have worked with caregivers for many, 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 many years and the most extraordinary people I have ever met. But they're often very um, less interested in focusing on themselves. And so if there's one tiny thing I can say here is to encourage caregivers to really think about what their needs are and to um, find ways to find support and find um, ways to get their own needs met along the way. And there are so many opportunities for caregiver supports. And these are supports that are um, available, again, through Les Turner, through many, many other ALS organizations around the country. Peer supports are critical with caregivers, absolutely, as it is with um, people living with ALS, getting like with like to be able to share ideas, suggestions, um, respite care. That's where you get a break. That's where caregivers get a break. So I highly encourage caregivers to look into what those opportunities may or may not exist. And oftentimes those respite programs are through local and state caregiver support programs. So um, checking in with your local area on aging, your local disability and aging resource center to see what kinds of rest opportunities might be available as well as through our ALS organizations. And when I say balance, it's finding that balance between taking care of yourself and taking care of someone else. And that is probably the hardest thing to do. And I'm sure that all of the caregivers on this call, however many you might be, are saying the same thing. That is a very hard thing to do. And that's where you lean on respite care, you lean on peer support programs, and psychotherapy. Who can you talk to? What kinds of mental health supports can you get through your community, through um, ALS organizations to really help you manage those mental health stressors and struggles? And the other thing that is really important, and it's been wonderful to see over the years, so many caregivers get really involved in advocacy. And oftentimes we'll see people get more involved in advocacy after their loved ones is away, which makes sense because of the time that just doesn't exist while they're being a full-time caregiver. But even if you do have time being a caregiver, doing something around raising funds, around raising awareness, around political support, going to the nation's capital, doing whatever it is to find those kind of advocacy are brilliant outlets for caregivers because they're carving that space to know that they're doing um, even more. And, and by no means is this a, a requirement for caregivers to just add more to their plate, but it's one of the ways that caregivers can find support and have found really wonderful opportunities there. So I'll switch to say, we talked about adults living with ALS, we talked about adult caregivers, but we know that adults, it's not only adults who experience mental health. And um, this is an area I have spent a lot of time, research and clinical, really understanding how families talk about illness when there's children in the home. And the reason why I start with this slide is, this has everything to do with the child and youth mental health. So we know that there are elevated levels of depression, social and peer isolation in children when there is a family member with an illness. They're certainly found across all disorders. This is not exclusive to ALS by any stretch, 
But when there's not enough information within the family, meaning when there's not enough communication about the illness in the family, then we do see children having more um, anxiety, more fear, kind of guilt about what's happening. And that can trickle down to some of those psychological poor well-being. So poor coping skills, um, you know, difficulty with school, difficulty looking about things. So it's really important to consider in the whole picture of mental health that there are children and youth involved as well. And much, much like we see in the adult population, they are experiencing anxiety. They're particularly experiencing social isolation, not only because not many of their friends that they know of have a family member with ALS, but also because they don't really know how to talk about it. And that can be a very stressful thing they can also have a lot of guilt. And it's, it's, it's odd when people say, well, why do they have guilt, Melinda? Guilt, when you're a young child, and we see this more in our younger children, they often internalize the illness and they'll internalize that something happened that they might have been somehow responsible for. So that's one way that young kids feel guilt when they aren't clearly shared information about the illness. Uh, what we also see is as the children and youth get older and they maybe want to go and do their own thing, maybe they want to go spend a little more time with their friends outside the home, there's some guilt for doing that. There's guilt for I'm not at home taking care of this or I'm not helping my mom or not helping my dad. So these kinds of issues are very clearly impactful to children, youth and young adults. And I don't miss that young adult piece. Um, that is an age group. And when I say young adult, 19 to 25 ish, um, that's a really complex time because that's when people are considering college. They're considering maybe taking on a new career. Maybe they want to get married and have children. And it's very hard at that age to know how to talk about this, how to address your parent, how do I feel about my own guilt with moving forward. Um, and it's really important to recognize that people across all ages, our children, youth, and our young adults, are all experiencing these same kinds of mental health um, issues. And it very often comes down to lack of communication. And when I say lack of communication, what we know is that families often very much struggle with talking about the illness. And there's a lot of different reasons. And there's been some really wonderful research looking into this um, research that I've been really fortunate to be a part of. My colleagues in the Netherlands, um, people around the world are really looking in how do families talk or not talk, more to the point, about illness and some of the reasons why. And when we talk about some of the reasons why, maybe this will be helpful for you as a family to think, if we could kind of break down some of these barriers, that absolutely will make an impact on our family's overall mental health. Because often families don't talk about the illness because they fear about their own emotional response, right? Um, there's a lot of concerns around if I'm gonna to be too emotional in front of my children or my grandchildren, even my young adult children, even my 20s and 30 something children, I don't wanna cry in front of them. So recognizing that that that's often a barrier. There's another barrier where people feel like they are protecting their children. And, and again, when I say children, I'm not only talking about young children. I'm also talking about that young adult population that is also kind of part of this idea of I'm protecting them. Um, we also know that families have a lot of cultural expectations around what we talk about and what we don't talk about. And, and this is so, so important. And, and in my estimation, does not get brought up enough um, that we as healthcare providers, we as mental health providers, whoever's on the call, who participates in any sort of professional engagement around mental health and families, really needs to dig deep in some of these cultural expectations because these are also 
um, often triggers for not addressing mental health. So mental health as a whole, and then also talking about the illness can very much be affected by cultural expectations of what we don't talk about. Like we don't talk about this uh, because of this is how we do or don't do as a family, as a culture, as a society, as a group. Um, so it's a really, really critical piece. There's often a real lack of understanding of the disease process. And this is where organizations like Les Turner can really come in and say, okay, this is what ALS is. This is how we can help you understand the disease itself, because when the family has a better sense of what the disease is, and at least an idea of maybe what might be happening, because we can't say exactly, then they have a better opportunity to really share it. And, and when they're feeling comfortable about talking about their illness, then that child, that youth, that young adult, they feel better. And when and when the stress and anxiety is lessened, that's better for everybody. And that's absolutely part and parcel of um, mental health in families. So we've talked about kind of population specific, uh, adults with ALS, adult caregivers, and children and youth who are living in families with ALS. But what really kind of permeates a lot of these issues in the family around taxation, around mental health, is this idea of genetic risk, right? And it's becoming more and more important to have these kinds of conversations as we're finding more uh, genetic markers. And, you know, it really wasn't even that many years ago where it was just a very few. And so it kind of felt like, well, we can talk about it, but it just doesn't affect that many people. But the truth is, it absolutely does affect a lot of people. And the need for support around genetic risk and, and the work that, you know, Les Turner's doing, and I have a slide later on, um, there's a patient-led group called End the Legacy, that they're really trying to wrap everybody's minds around, we need to have these conversations and we need to be prepared for them. And I come at it from I spent many years in Huntington's disease before I started working more in ALS. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Huntington's disease, it is also a genetic disorder, and but it is purely genetic. So if someone in the family has Huntington's disease, each child of an affected parent has a 50-50 chance of inheriting Huntington's disease. And what that means is you might have one, you might have 10. Um, and so every person in that family has their flip of a coin. And what I learned in working with, and in many years working with um, families living with Huntington's disease is that living in a family with genetic illness is overwhelming and absolutely impacts your mental health. And you might live with, with hope that you aren't getting it, but at the same time, you're also living with the stress and anxiety of being at risk. Am I going to get this? Am I a gene carrier? What's, the, what's, the, what's my status, right? And the stigma with that, the stigma with, you know, there's a lot of really interesting and, and, and building conversation around family planning. So if I am someone who is a gene carrier. Um, you know, what are my thoughts about family planning? Who do I talk to? How do I support? And is there stigma out there around someone who's a gene carrier having a child with it? And there's this is not a conversation to say there's there's answers here, but this is the conversation that says this is really impactful on individuals' mental health, on their potential for depression and anxiety, and often very severe mental health responses when you're looking at, I'm going to get this, as opposed to something that I have absolutely no idea I might just wake up one day and get. And so in the work that I did in Huntington's disease, really understood that the, the, the complexity of it 
includes things like hope and stigma and being at risk and the isolation of an illness like this. And my fam- what does my family think? And then being a caregiver and not just being a caregiver, but being a caregiver to someone who has an illness that you yourself will get at some point is quite profound and has a deep, deep impact on mental health. And what we know about testing. So when we think about um, testing, genetic testing, and there's so much wonderful work out there. I am not a genetic counselor, so I am not here to give any sort of guidance one way or the other. But what I am going to talk about is research that I've done with um, youth and young adults who know that they're at risk. And this is important to include because we're talking about it in the context of mental health and the stressor of, am I going to get it? Should I get tested? When can I get tested? What do I do? These are important conversations for families to have, but they're very much important conversations for people to reach out for support. So reach out to the Les Turner Foundation, reach out to your local mental health provider, your physician, your neurologist, get some support in these kinds of conversations because they're absolutely critical and they um, are really growing. The more we understand about the genetics of ALS, the more these kinds of conversations are going to be so, so, so critical. So when we think about supporting the mental health in children and youth, I have a lot of resources here. These are books that I've written over the years. And this is the Y Care program, which provides kind of caregiving skills and education, but it also provides that peer engagement that we know is so critical for both children and adults. And so when you're thinking about the mental health of children and youth, it is about that peer, particularly our children and youth, because where they are developmentally is so, so important. There's a lot of sweet spots in our children and youth where they need that peer engagement and they need that peer support. Um, School-based education and support, a lot of children really struggle cognitively in school because of the stress and anxiety of ALS. We have a guide there for helping children and youth um, get support at school. So that's a support for school staff. Um, I talked earlier about the young adults. So that book off to my lower right hand side in the corner of your screen, um, that is written for young adults. And I know that the young adult issue is really uh, complex and it doesn't get addressed enough for those young 20-somethings or early 30s to know how to really talk about their family and how to get support. Um, and then, as I said, the caregiving education and support with the Y Care program. Um, all of these are available on um, the Global Neuro Y Care website, which I'll show you at the end. All of the books are also available on the ALS Association website under their children and youth tabs. They're all freely available download. The graphic novel has now been translated into nine languages. So if anybody on this call speaks something other than English, we want you to know that we're working really hard to have it in as many languages as possible so that we are supporting mental health and children and youth worldwide. So the last big topic for the last next like 10 minutes or so is grief and loss. And, and I don't mean to minimize it by putting it at the end or to, you know, at all speed through it, because again, this is its own webinar. And I actually have given a webinar on this topic with Les Turner. So, um, so I believe that that is available if you want to check that out, because I'm going to talk about some of the issues in that much larger webinar. I'm going to uh, approach some of them here. But the issue is really critical with families and understanding how they do and don't talk about death and dying and what that does to family members' mental health. Because we know that just simply living with the illness brings about stress and anxiety and depression. But trying to wrap your mind around the eventual death and dying is profound and it's fun for all of our members, not the least of which the person living with the illness. So for them to be able to have that support to talk with the rest of their family members, that helps people feel less anxious, less anxiety, less depression around what these big, big issues of death and dying really represent for the family as a whole, 
for the children and for the person living with ALS. And grief. Grief is often incredibly overwhelming and it's an emotion, which is why I've put it in here in our mental health talk, right? This is that emotional well-being. This is the loss. This is the loss of a loved one. And that loved one could be your spouse, your parent, your grandparent. And, and the thing that is really, really important is that grief is natural. And I put this here because it, in a surprising kind of consistent conversations with families over the years, people feel abnormal grieving. People feel that they don't have the right to be incredibly emotional or feel cognitively kind of confused and overwhelmed. These are all absolutely normal processes with grief. And they're part of that mental health response and that need to address mental health. So if you are someone who is grieving the loss of a loved one, some of the best things you can do is reach out for support from an ALS organization with the Les Turner Foundation. Find those peer support so that you can talk about your grief with someone because you deserve it. And it has um, a real impact on your mental health. And something that doesn't get talked about as much but is part of it is this idea of anticipatory grief. And, and again, I bring this in because this is also very important around mental health because we're talking about anticipating the loss. And if we think about that, that is very sad and that is very overwhelming. And what we know about ALS is that there are several points along the continuum where people can feel really strong anticipatory grief because of the way ALS works. So at diagnosis, right at diagnosis, there's often people are in denial, people take it and say, okay, we're gonna fight it. Other people say immediately, oh, that's a punch in the gut. I'm going to lose my loved one. and that's not at all uncommon to at diagnosis already start feeling that anticipatory grief, that loss of the voice, the loss of their joke, the loss of running through the streets with them or whatever it is that you used to do with your loved one. Um, at diagnosis is a really key point. And thinking back to when you might consider getting support, absolutely at diagnosis. Take any and all supports that are offered to you from the ALS clinic, from Les Turner, from anybody and everybody, because it's going to continue to change. And so when the disease progresses, we see new symptoms, we need, we see loss of function. Those are also really deeply grieving time because that's when you see the person you loved is not the same person. They're not gone and you still love them, but things have changed and you're grieving those losses. And then very, very clearly at the end, at that death, there is absolute grief, but you're anticipating it all along the way. And these are really important things to recognize, to honor as someone who's living through it, as a caregiver, as a family member, and to also reach out to get that support because the mental health is absolutely impacted. That emotional uh, well-being is absolutely taking a hit during this process. And so making sure that you're getting support, that you're attending to the depression, that you're attending to the stress, the anxiety is absolutely critical because what we can often see is complicated grief. And complicated grief is exactly as it sounds. It's grief that is normal, that emotional loss, that, that deep um, pain, but it's complicated, meaning that it continues on in a way that doesn't um, kind of go with the natural ebb and flow. And as someone who has lost very close um, family members in, in often very difficult ways, grief doesn't stop. Grief, grief stays with you for the rest of your life, but 
you live with it and you embrace it and it becomes some sort of your friend along your journey. But when it becomes complicated, when you aren't able to function in, in any day life, when you have that loss of interest compounded over time, when you cannot sleep, you have no appetite or fear of being alone. Um, maybe when children particularly regress, they start out like little, little children when they've already aged out or changed into a developmental stage. Um, or more intensely, thoughts of wanting to die to be with that person who has died with ALS, um, avoiding any sort of peers and friends, even loved ones. These are some of the signs of complicated grief. And as you see, they are all mental health issues. And so I put this up here so that it's really clear that people know, again, grief is part of who you are when you lose a loved one. It, it doesn't just disappear completely. But you should be able to, over time, find a way to live with it, to sit with it, and in some people's minds, to embrace it. But when it's complicated, it can have absolute severe impacts on your mental health, your mental well-being, and absolutely needs to be addressed. So when we think about how do we address complicated grief, you know, it is finding support from professionals, from teachers, social workers, clinics, um, looking to peer support groups because these are, again, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of peer peer groups because they're going through it too, and they can help give guidance, support, and suggestions. Um, Sometimes if you can find opportunity, and I said this in the caregiver slide, if you can find opportunity for something that takes you outside of your immediate overwhelming grief, something like advocacy, something like disease awareness, working with a local organization, you know, working with Les Turner, um, working with a researcher, doing research, um, those are things that can help you kind of step back from the deep well of that complicated grief and help you find a way to kind of move through it, not away from it and not having it gone completely, but, but move through it and have it go with you in a way that you can use that for more um, disease awareness and advocacy opportunities. But recognizing the need for always having a constant open expression, an open opportunity to talk with friends and family, to not shut down, to not close off, to not uh, socially isolate. Those are things that really can lead to some complicated grief. So um, a real encouragement to um, take, that, take that first step. It's a hard one, I know but to take that first step to really look outside and see what kind of ports you can get um, so that grief does not become complicated for you. Um, so we'll transition to closing slides. And I hope this has been a helpful webinar. Um, as I said, there's so much we could talk about. Um, I just don't have all the time and I wanted to make sure I left some time for questions and answers. But one of the things I'm really excited about and I'm proud to be a part of this is um, working with colleagues in Alabama, um, with the ALS Regional Group, with the ALS Association region down there, and with the Mental Health of America, Montgomery, Alabama, um, working to build a national network and so this is not exclusive to Alabama, it just happens to be starting there. But what we're really looking to is build a network of mental health professionals who are trained in ALS, because like I said earlier, we just don't have that right now. And so um, here's this information, I'm happy to share more. Um, the Melissa Enfinger is just amazing and is really working with the Mental Health of America to create an education program um, that will train mental health providers across the country in what is ALS? Why do we need to take, why do we need to attend things like breathing and what role does anxiety play? And why do we see so much depression in people living with ALS? So really attending to those very specific ALS needs is, is what we need across this country to build our mental health um, support and workforce. I love this quote. It's always really important to me to use 
some sort of words of families. Um, and because of all the work I do with children, those children don't exist in a vacuum. They don't exist all by themselves. They exist in families. And all of the family members are deeply affected, particularly their mental health. So um, I, I just want to say that illness affects the whole family and mental health issues affects the whole family. So it's an important quote to hear the words of a parent who has a spouse living with ALS and has children that they're really trying to figure out how do they can, can take care of all of their mental health concerns. Um, uh, Anne-Marie talked about some of the resources. I just put this really briefly up here. This is by no means all of the resources available. Um, Les Turner does some extraordinary things. They're my decision tool. The learning series, there are tons of talks like this. There are tons of materials available. Um, and the legacy is the patient-led genetic ALS and FTD organization. Um, really fantastic and working really hard to kind of connect and put that issue around genetics uh, more to the forefront as we talk about care for people with ALS, living with ALS. Um, Global Neuro Y Care, that's the foundation myself and my colleagues started about a year ago. Um, we are an international repository of resources and support for children and youth around the world. Everything we do, we're working very hard to translate to as many languages as possible. We're also building and developing materials for healthcare providers to train them in how to talk with parents and how to talk with children so that that barrier between uh, the kind of family and the healthcare provider doesn't exist anymore because that's a huge impact on mental health of the family. And then lastly, Rune. If you haven't checked out Rune, there are so many I mean, brief videos that talk about everything from what is ALS to, you know, how do you use a gate belt? So um, it's a phenomenal resource. This is only the small portion. Um, there are so many other wonderful resources out there that can be supportive for you. Um, so in closing, just briefly, all family members experience issues with mental health. Um, families struggle with what to say, when to say it, but reach out for support absolutely reach out for support because it might feel like there aren't supports out there, but genuinely there are. Um, seek professionals that can particularly help guide the conversation around genetic risk. Um, the focus on grief and loss is so, so, so critical. And I encourage you all to um, acknowledge it and seek guidance around it and know that your healthcare providers across the allied health uh, continuum, speaking as a social worker, um, are really there and can absolutely support you and your family. Um, so I want to say thank you. Thank you to the Les Turner Foundation for always inviting me um, to do these webinars. I, I so enjoy them. Um, I so enjoy doing them. That is my information. That's my information with my, my university hat, my professor hat. Please feel free to email me with any questions. This is Global Neuro Y Care, which is our foundation for children and family resources have a look. Uh, we also are, the, are the, the, the home of and the owners of the Lukey and the Lights uh, movie for children and youth. We can talk about, um, you can certainly look that up on our website. So thank you very much. And there are a lot of bibliographies. So you're more than welcome to read all of those. That's it. Thank you. Um, Linda, thank you so, so much um, on that presentation. You covered so much. So I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I am going to jump back. Am I here? here. <laughs> okay. Yes, you, yes, you are. Um, it's so weird to do a presentation when you can't see yourself. It's like, oh, I just... know. <laughs> okay. And there we go. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we do have some that were submitted. Um, before but if anybody is watching and has a question we do have a chat feature on the toolbar near the right so feel free to drop any questions in there um melinda one of the things that you kind of started to touch on and i'm wondering if you have any tips on it but you talked about kind of that family dynamic and the dynamic between children and parents and if 
um, your parent is the person who has ALS and you're starting to maybe notice some, some maybe mental health, like whether it's they're anxious or maybe they're a little bit more down. Do you have any tips on how to approach that conversation? Because I understand that, you know, some families, you know, children should be seen and not heard, right, is a phrase that kind of was thrown around a lot. Um, so yeah. how do you, do you have any tips on, you know, maybe I'm a teen or maybe I'm a young adult and I, I think we all could benefit from talking to somebody, but how do I initiate that conversation? It can be very, very difficult, made, made difficult by the potential for cognitive impairment. If there okay. is some cognitive impairment that, that the person living with ALS is also experiencing, because then more onus is on us as the caregiver and the family member to not push the conversation. Because if they're, if they're struggling with kind of cognitively grasping what's going on, it's not going to help if you're just kind of push, 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 you're doing this, you're doing this. So first of all, making sure that you're able to step back and say kind of where is my loved one's kind of cognition, if you will, right? Um, if they are having some cognitive issues, then that's definitely an opportunity and a really important time to reach out for support. Speak with your neurologist, speak with your healthcare provider. We're seeing some of these changes. We're also seeing some, which is not surprising at all, some concurrent irritability, some anxiety, and some kind of anger outbursts. Certainly medication can help with those, and I'm not trying to say everybody take a pill, but medication can absolutely help with those, particularly when someone's kind of struggling with the cognitive opportunity to be able to step back and kind of have the insight to say, am I doing this? If I'm doing this, here's how I can help. And most of that's what we run into is that when families struggle with that, it's because there's also that cognitive impairment piece. Um, so reach out for help from your healthcare provider, talk about medications. And, you know, sometimes it's about just redirecting. If someone is really irritable or really, really anxious, sometimes a super quick redirect will almost like change someone instantly and go, oh, wait, what are we talking about? Sometimes that can diffuse the situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great advice. That's great advice. Um, and then what about, again, you kind of touched on this as well, but asking for help, right? Um, and knowing when to ask for help, um, knowing how to how to ask somebody. So maybe I'm a caregiver, and you know mm -hmm. I, I feel like I don't have the support that I need. But it's my understanding there are people, you know, people want to help, um, but I just don't think we yeah. often know how to ask for that. So any tips on how to ask ask for help? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Someone, a family that I work with recently said to me, well, we'll reach out when we know the time is right. Well, if you're saying that, then quite frankly, the time is time past for it to be right. So the time was right a while back. Um, so, it, but it's very hard, particularly caregivers who are like, I'm juggling 85 things. The last thing I have time for is reaching out for someone. So I will actually put a little bit of this back on our providers and our, our program staff and our nonprofit organizations that you guys are so busy and I get it, but it's, it's that it's almost like creating more of a two way street to having those occasional phone calls to having those emails. I know organizations do that. Sometimes caregivers will respond when someone reaches out to them as well. But as the caregiver, I think what we really need to continue to share with caregivers is it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask for help. You don't have to do it all. It does not make you bad or weak or wrong or anything. But but when that person from that amazing organization calls you, take the call because <laughs> they're also reaching out, right? And so um, it, it, it's a real hard one. It's a constant conversation and it's not, I mean, it's, it, it's very, very common across illnesses that particularly caregivers really struggle with, okay, I'll ask for help. Recognizing that sometimes in the past, maybe they did ask for help and they didn't get it. And so they're like, well, no one's going to be able to help me. Um, so it, it's a really complex one. I'd love to be able to snap my fingers and say, hey, that happens, but it's a tough one. Just giving yourself the grace that it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. 
I think I think that's wonderful <laughs> advice and just always always a good reminder. Um, and thank you for mentioning the support groups. Um, if anybody's watching and you're a caregiver, we have a caregiver only support group. So it's run by one of our support group facilitators. It is just for caregivers. Um, she herself was a caregiver. So if that's something that you're interested in, it's all virtual. You don't have to be in the Chicagoland area to attend. You can find that on our website under our support services um, tab. We also do, um, like Melinda mentioned, have some great resources for caregivers on caregiver self-care and how to talk to children with ALS and all of that can also be found on our website um, under the education tab. And also feel free to email me. I'm happy to send any of those links directly to anybody. I'm at adoyle at lesturnerals.org um, or education at ALS. Um, at lesturnerals.org. Um, thank you so much, um, everybody, for attending. I'm just going to check yeah. the chat one more time. It's like <laughs> good. Um, so we would love for you all to save the date. And Melinda, this ties in really nicely to kind of the end of oh, your Oh, this is wonderful. Um, but we'll be having Lainey Dratch, um, <laughs> who's a genetic counselor out at Penn Medicine, who's going to be talking about genetic counseling and um, kind of that topic of is the ALS um, in my family genetic or um, how do I how do I know if it's genetic is genetic testing right for me um, should I meet with a genetic counselor so all of that will be happening on Wednesday January 31st at noon um, it should be up in our website to register um, within the next coming days but again if anybody um, is looking for that or can't find that please feel free to reach out to me I'm happy to send you that link um, and last but not least, we are coming to the end. I cannot believe that we've gone through a full calendar <laughs> year. Um, I hope everybody has a safe and lovely holiday season. Um, there will be a survey at the end of this presentation, so please feel free to fill that out. Be honest, you know, um, your feedback helps us develop um, better tools and better programming. So um, again, thank you. And we'll see everybody in January. Everybody stay safe. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.